Exercise 39, Topic 1. Listen to part of a lecture. Then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have 20 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now listen to part of a lecture in a botany class. The professor is discussing flowering plants. Flowering plants have traditionally been divided into two major classes, dicots and monocots. The actual basis for the distinction is the number of cotyledons. Remember, cotyledons are the seed leaves that the embryo produces. In monocots, there is a single seed leaf, and in dicots, there are two seed leaves. Although there are a number of other characteristics that distinguish them, two are particularly useful. The number of flower parts and the leaf vein patterns are different in the two classes. The petals of the flowers, or other flower parts, are divisible by three in monocots, whereas they are divisible by four or five in dicots. And a parallel leaf structure is usual in monocots, but dicots tend to have numerous auxiliary veins that connect the major veining. That seems relatively straightforward then, right? Wrong. Botanists are not always in agreement regarding several families of flowering plants because they have a combination of characteristics that don't fit neatly into the classifications. For example, water lilies have leaf veining like dicots, but it appears that there is only a single seed leaf, as would be expected in a monocot. So how can this happen? Well, we believe that the two groups may actually have a shared ancestor, a basic group, probably more similar to the dicots, from which the monocots have evolved. This means that no one characteristic of a flowering plant, the number of flower parts, leaf veining, or even the number of seed leaves, is going to be sufficient to identify it as either a monocot or a dicot. Referring to the main points and examples from the lecture, describe the two general groups of flowering plants. Then explain the problem for classification that the professor presents. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Example speaking answer. Dicots and monocots are the two major classes of flowering plants. Basically, a monocot has one seed leaf and a dicot has two. In monocots, the number of petals can be divided evenly by three, but in dicots, the number can be divided evenly by four or five. Also, Monocots have parallel veins in their leaves, but dicots have, um, numerous veins with connecting patterns. Now, the problem in classification is that sometimes the characteristics overlap. The professor's example is the, the water lily, which has characteristics from both the monocot and the dicot. The professor explains that the two classifications may have descended from a common ancestor, and that makes classification of a plant on the basis of any one characteristic, 
that one characteristic is insufficient to identify it as either a monocot or a dicot. Exercise 39, Topic 2. Listen to part of a lecture, then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have 20 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now listen to part of a lecture in an engineering class. The professor is discussing bridge construction. Okay, let's talk about bridge construction, specifically arch bridges and suspension bridges. Arch bridges have been a standard for bridge construction since ancient times because they are very stable structures. In an arch, the force of the load is carried outward from the top to the ends of the arch, where abutments prevent the ends from pulling apart. So you see, an arch bridge can be designed so that no part of it has to withstand tension. Another advantage of arch bridges is the fact that they can be constructed from such a wide variety of materials, including stone, brick, timber, cast iron, steel, or reinforced concrete. It's also adaptable. The deck can be propped above the arch or hung below the arch. One major disadvantage of the arch bridge, though, the bridge is completely unstable until the two spans meet in the middle. So that can make an arch bridge a little tricky to build. Now, a suspension bridge consists of a deck suspended from cables. The two largest cables, or main cables, are hung from towers with the cable ends buried in huge concrete blocks or rock called anchorages. The cables support the weight of the bridge and transfer the load to the anchorages and the towers. Suspension bridges are considered aesthetically beautiful and because they are relatively light and strong, they can be used for the longest spans. The cables, usually of high tensile wire, can support an immense weight, but the design does have the disadvantage of potential bending in the roadway. And because suspension bridges are light and flexible, wind is always a serious concern. Referring to the main points and examples from the lecture, describe the two types of bridge construction presented by the professor. Then explain the specific advantages and disadvantages of each type. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Example speaking answer. The professor describes two types of bridges, the arch bridge and the suspension bridge. Arch bridges are very stable because the weight is distributed from the top to the ends of the arch where abutments keep the ends from separating. In addition to stability, an advantage of arch bridges is that they can be constructed from many different materials like wood, steel, stone, brick, or concrete. The problem is that an arch is difficult to build because it's unstable until the middle span is complete. Now suspension bridges, they have a deck suspended from cables that are hung from towers. So the cables support the weight 
and distribute the load to anchorages of concrete or rock and to the towers as well. Suspension bridges are beautiful, and they're light and strong, which makes them appropriate choices for the longest spans. The problem is that the deck of a suspension bridge may bend, and they're not appropriate for very windy areas. Exercise 40, Topic 1. Listen to part of a lecture. Then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have 20 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now listen to part of a lecture in an anatomy class. The professor is discussing the functions of the liver. So that brings us to our discussion of the liver, the largest internal organ in the human body. As you already know, it's part of the digestive system, and it performs more than 500 functions. Today we'll talk about the three primary functions of the liver. First, the liver functions as a storage system. The liver stores energy in the form of glycogen, which is made from a type of sugar called glucose. When the glucose levels in the blood are high, the liver uses the glucose to create glycogen and stores it as energy that can be used later. When the glucose level in the blood falls below the minimum level, the liver changes glycogen into glucose for energy. The liver also stores essential vitamins such as A, D, K, and the B vitamins, all of which are critical to maintain good health. In addition to storing energy and vitamins, the liver produces essential chemicals, including important proteins like albumin, which retains calcium and regulates the movement of water from the bloodstream to the tissues, and globin, which is key to maintaining the immune system, and uh, cholesterol, an important part of the cell membrane which is used to transport fats in the blood to tissues in the body. All right, the last crucial function of the liver is to help eliminate toxic substances such as alcohol and drugs from the bloodstream. To clear these harmful substances, the liver absorbs them, then chemically alters them, and finally excretes them into bile. And the bile works its way out of the system through the small intestine of the digestive tract. Referring to the main points and examples from the lecture, describe the three basic functions of the liver presented by the professor. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Example speaking answer. The liver has more than 500 functions, but the professor concentrates on three. First, the liver is used as a storage system. The liver regulates the glucose levels in the blood, and when it's too high, the liver converts glucose into glycogen and stores it as energy for later use. When the glucose level's too low, it changes the glycogen back into glucose for energy. The liver also stores vitamins A, B, D, and K. 
Second, the liver is a chemical system. It produces essential proteins, um, proteins that transport water and fats from the blood to uh, tissues in the body. And they also support the immune system. Third, the liver eliminates toxic material from the blood. For example, drugs and alcohol. Um, the liver absorbs them and changes their chemical composition and excretes them into bile that gets eliminated through the small intestine. Now listen to part of a lecture in a psychology class. The professor is discussing how behavior can be predicted. In addition to describing behavior, psychologists try to predict future performance. We do this by designing studies that determine relationships between the behavior that we expect with the behavior that we can actually record. We use a statistical measurement called a correlation to tell us whether two variables, like perhaps two test scores, whether they vary together in the same way. For example, studies have shown a positive correlation between a student's performance on the SAT, that's the Scholastic Aptitude Test, and the same student's performance in college courses. It's a positive correlation because the higher the score on the SAT, the better we can expect the college grades to be. But what about a negative correlation? Well, other studies suggest that getting a lot of sleep the night before taking the SAT will result in fewer errors on the verbal section. So in a negative correlation like that, the variables move in the opposite direction. The more hours sleep, the fewer verbal errors. Now, that's all well and good, but the problem occurs when we try to understand why correlations exist. That gets us into causality. You see, there are so many potentially uncontrolled or unknown factors that the two variables we are studying may appear to be connected, but they may both be responding to a common third variable. Let's go back to the SAT verbal example. What if the students who slept well the night before the SAT were all very intelligent or were more prepared for the verbal section or, by chance, many words that they already knew showed up on the exam? Then the real cause wouldn't be the sleep at all. Referring to the main points and examples from the lecture describe two types of research correlations that the professor presents, then explain causality. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Example speaking answer. A correlation indicates whether two variables correspond. I mean, whether they vary in the same way. The professor uses the example of students' scores on the SAT and their performances in college to demonstrate a positive correlation. If a student has a high SAT score, we can expect good grades in college. The variables move in the same direction. 
Um, the professor uses the example of getting a good night's sleep before taking the SAT and uh, the number of incorrect answers on the verbal section. That's an example of a negative correlation. If a student gets a good night's sleep, we can expect fewer errors. The variables move in opposite directions. But, but even when a correlation can be shown, we don't know the cause. The two variables could be affected by a third factor they have in common. As an example, the students in the study might be more prepared for the verbal section and would have performed well whether they were rested or not. This is the end of the speaking exercises. Remember, you are improving your English. Continue to work toward your goal.